This is Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. This week's episode is made possible by our friends at Final Flight Outfitters, the family-owned outdoor store that has all the apparel and outdoor equipment you need for your next hunting or fishing trip. Visit finalflight.net for more information. Today's guest is Scott Graves, founder of Special Ops Excursions. This is Scott Williams, the host of Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where every single week we talk about the history, the people, and the culture of our home right here in West Tennessee. Today, I've got a really special guest um, who has taken um, a little grain of an idea and made it into a successful nonprofit. We're going to hear a lot about the work that he's doing um, with Special Ops Excursions. Welcome, Scott Graves. Hey, guys. Glad to be here. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, you bet. Um, as I said a minute ago, hopefully we can remember each other's name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, tell me a little bit about um, your past. Where did you grow up? Where are you from? You know, where'd you go to school? That kind of thing. Yeah, so uh, I am lucky enough to be from right here in West Tennessee. Grew up not too far from Union City in DPA. Uh, left for college at UT Knoxville back in the late 90s. And after completing UT Knoxville, moved to Nashville. Uh, in 2003, started a small business there and operated that, um, I guess, until last fall. Just kind of sold the company off last year and uh, have now moved into full-time operations at the nonprofit. I'm a full-time volunteer. So what uh, what uh, town near Discovery Park did you grow up in? Uh, Trimble, if you know where that is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. Were your family farmers or? Uh Mix. My grandparents raised me, and they were farmers. Yes, so we oh, grew up here, kind of grew up on the farm. Oh yeah. So I call it Trimble. It's not really a town where I grew up at. It's just more or less a road and plenty of corn, wheat, and beans in all directions. Um. And so you um, did you know what you uh early on did you know that you didn't want to stay and be a farmer or well you know what what did you and what did you major in when you went off to college? Sure. So like, I guess I can think all of my current everything to a, a teacher named Dan Smith at Dyer County High School, who's my ag teacher. Uh, I took a, a random horticulture class with Dan, I guess my junior year of high school, and just really enjoyed it. So uh, I'd also had been a lifelong lover of the arts. I love to paint and draw, always have kind of combined those two passions into a degree of uh, land design there at UT Knoxville, a degree called OHLD. So I uh, that was my actual degrees in horticulture and design. And so my business in Nashville is a design firm, uh, designing pools, pool houses, outdoor kitchens and fireplaces, uh, a lot of new construction in the area with the booming, booming of Nashville. So uh, a lot of builders would call us up and go, how do you driveway plan, plan for landscaping, irrigation, lighting, outdoor living. I'll kind of draw all of that up for them and kind of help the process during construction as well, like a non-liable GC. Yeah. So that's interesting. So <clears throat> did you uh, start off working like as a landscaper early on, like right after college and work your way up into this company? Of course. So uh, first job post-college was the John Deere Landscapes in Gallatin outside of Nashville, where I was a nursery rep, more or less uh, taking and procuring orders for materials for projects, you know, plants, irrigation, uh, pavers for patios, kind of all of those things. And with that, you know, I had my long-term goal and kind of goal one was, you know, see what people are using in the market and what things cost to do a better job at designing in the future. You can always draw a plan up with no idea in mind of what it might cost to install it. And if a client tells you, I've got a $10,000 budget, but you draw a $95,000 plan, you're out of business really fast. So kind of the goal was, you know, learn the trade, learn the guys who are installing it. You know, what did they charge? Uh, what plants they like and not like, what materials are out there, what can you find, what can you not find. So I did that for my first about 18 months post-college. Then I worked for a installation company as a designer and sales rep for about 12 months after that, and then launched my own company. And I felt like I had the, the bases there to do it, you know, effectively. So you're clearly, uh, you have an entrepreneurial spirit, as they say. 
Yes. <laughs> and we're going to talk a little bit in a minute about how you applied that to your um, nonprofit. Uh, but take me back to the point where you were, you know, in your, uh, in, in what was your company called? Your landscape and design firm? Yeah, it was DSG Designs. Okay. So, so DSG, so you're working there. Um, at what point did the seed get planted to use the agriculture uh, metaphor? Did the seed get planted for what would one day become uh, this uh, great nonprofit that you're working with? So I'll give you the long story quickly. Uh, so my grandparents again raised me here in West Tennessee. So I'm living in Nashville. Uh, my grandparents had passed away from nursing homes and they had left me a farmhouse in the Trimble area. So thinking about ways to use the farmhouse, my wife and I decided that we would have a open a small uh, little hunting club here in West Tennessee, just for my buddies, some guys from Memphis and Nashville who uh, loved the outdoors but lacked a place to go. So we fixed the farmhouse up and we had a little backyard dove field. Uh, we'd have you know duck leases at Real Foot Lake, hunting backyard deer. And that was probably about the 2008 time frame, 07, 08. Uh, that went really well. We really enjoyed that. Uh, with my growing business in Nashville, that just kind of with Nashville feeding itself and growing so fast, uh, by 2012, we'd kind of decided, hey, let's kind of close the hunting club down. This is our, our farmhouse. We love visiting. There are always guys there. Uh, let's kind of close that down just for us to use for us and our friends for a little we can get away out of the city. Uh, same time frame, fall of 2012, I go to visit a local hometown girl, Becca Brewer, now Becca Bolin, uh, and her husband, Brian, who is a Green Beret at Fort Lewis in Washington State. So uh, we go out there and visit Becca and Brian, have a great trip. And I'm just an average civilian. I have no military background. Uh, I am aware of the war on terror, like everybody else. It's on the news every now and then. You still see it. Uh, but I didn't know the Green Beret really did versus from movies you see here and there. Uh, so Brian has kind of explained to me what a Green Beret is, what a Green Beret does. And I was just in shock, you know, learning that Brian and his men uh, are out there deployed or training six, seven, eight, nine, ten months a year, every year. And it wasn't conventional like I'm used to uh, local friends in the National Guard here, maybe a year deployed, then two years home. You know, Brian and the guys are gone every year, and they're only home a few months a year for their entire career. It just, I was in shock, uh, didn't know about that, and I wanted to do something to give back. I didn't know what that was, and so again, talking to Brian as my catalyst, my muse for all of this, uh, Brian's like, yeah, a lot of guys love the outdoors in that world, you know, Green Berets, Navy SEALs. But with their op tempo, training tempo being so high, uh, they just quit the outdoors. They quit hunting, they quit fishing, and they give that up because they're gone so much. When they are home, it's family time. And so there's also a financial aspect of that. You know, guys really couldn't afford, you know, a $10,000 duck lease at Real Foot Lake to hunt four days a season. So again, you quit the outdoors. And uh, for a lot of the guys, that was how they decompress. That's uh, how they reset between deployments. So talked to Brian a little more about it. And we kind of had this little idea to turn my hunting lodge in Trimble into a place for military guys and their families to come out, relax and decompress between work trips. Uh, we never envisioned where it is now, you know, thinking I was small at the time. We were like, oh, we'll host, you know, a dove hunt per year, a deer hunt per year, a duck hunt per year. For a few guys, each time we'll do our part, we'll give back, we'll be patriots, we'll be patriotic, and that's going to be it. Uh, kind of fast forward a few months, Brian moved to Fort Bragg to be a Green Beret instructor, but he had a couple of buddies at Fort Campbell with fifth group Green Berets who were kind of like him. They didn't grow up in Tennessee. They're not from here. Love the outdoors. Nowhere to go. And how far is how far is Fort Campbell from Trimble? Uh, from Union City, two hours east, so Clarksville area, so very close. Uh, so, like, we kind of talked to some guys at Fort Campbell in fifth group, uh, threw out an invite to our annual dove hunt here in West Tennessee. Had a few guys come out, not knowing what to expect. 
you know, again, they're Green Berets. We're a bunch of farmers out here and guys who have regular jobs. We're kind of like, hope they're cool guys, hope they're polite and nice. Uh, we just didn't know. And so uh, these three guys were going to hunting camp with us. And uh, I mean, it was immediately we realized they're just like us. They're just normal guys. Uh, they love the outdoors, but instead of being a nine to five desk job, you know, selling insurance, they're Green Berets going down range, you know, six to nine months a year. So we had a ball. You know, we, we shot some birds together, uh, great camaraderie. We broke bread and just had an amazing experience. And those three guys, you know, we still talk very often. You know, we're still friends to this day, you know, six years later. And, uh, you know, so the event wraps up. And we're like, okay, we did our part. That was awesome. And then it kind of hit home as their friends kept calling us from base. Hey, my buddy Dave went with you dove hunting. Can I come out deer hunting? Another guy, Bob, called me up. Hey, my buddy Jesse went with you for a dove hunt. Can I do a duck hunt? And you, you've got to say yes. You can't turn the Green Beret down. So uh, we said yes to all these guys who kept calling us up. And that was kind of the first inkling of there's something here. There is a gap not being covered or fulfilled, at least at Fort Campbell. You know, there are a few other groups nationwide doing stuff like this, but nothing at Fort Campbell. And you have all these Green Berets there, uh, a lot of them who are, geographically speaking, their area of expertise is the Middle East. So they've been at war since 9-11 nonstop. And they're all burned out. They're all stressed. Uh, there's family dynamics there. You know, spouses are stressed. Kids are stressed. So, our thought was let's do our own nonprofit, our own 501c3 and do more for the guys at Fort Campbell. Now, did you, did you um, know already what a 501c3 was? <laughs> no idea. So uh, <laughs> I've got a, a very special wife who loves research. So she dove really deep into all of those things. Like, okay, we can do a 501c3 or a 501 this or that or that. Uh, we kind of, nailed down what our mission was, which our mission is uh, to provide outdoor adventures to active duty special operations warriors and their families. That's kind and of so for work. anybody listening who doesn't know what a 501c3 is, it's a nonprofit um, that um, does good in the community, like Discovery Park, like your organization, like, um, you know, um, some hospitals, you know, things like that. Basically charities that are out there doing good uh, for the community. And so, and so you, uh, I'm assuming it was your plan to do this on the side, but continue doing your regular job. Of course, of course. So uh, we applied to be a 501c3 in 2013. Uh, We're approved in 2014. And by that time, we had a fairly large volunteer network already in place, you know, here in rural West Tennessee. Uh, We have great people here, you know, that who wanted to help out and give back, you know, we were a small nonprofit. Uh, We lacked funding to pay for a lot of things. So we were very blessed that, you know, a lot of rural foot hunting guides would donate their unbooked days to our program. So our costs are very low where we can do a lot of good for not much money. And that was how much, how much time were you spending uh, generating all this? Cause I know that it takes time to make the calls. It takes, I mean, it, there's a lot of time invested. It is. Um, I mean, I would say the early days, maybe 10 hours per week. I was investing in this uh, by 2014. I'm already putting in 30, 40 hours a week on the side beyond my day job in my own company. Um, it just, it just kept growing and, It really took off beyond Fort Campbell as well. You know, by 2015, our guys are coming from Fort Campbell, of course, but we're also getting guys from other bases, from Fort Bragg, from Florida, from Virginia, from the D.C. area. You know, these guys, it's a very small world in this spec ops environment, and they all talk. They all work together. And so guys are wearing uh, one of our T-shirts, you know, downrange Afghanistan, and a guy will ask, oh, so what's the T-shirt from? Like I was my buddy Scott in Tennessee doing these cool trips for us. So what's his number? I'm getting all these cold calls from random operators around the globe. Like, oh, I met your buddy so-and-so. Can I come dove hunting or duck hunting, deer hunting? Again, you always say yes. You can't turn these guys down. And so we're doubling in numbers every year. 
Now, what what specifically um, does special ops mean? Like, how, how who is it that you're serving in, on yeah. these hunts? Yeah, so uh, SOCOM is the big military tip of the spear. We can kind of go down from that. Uh, under SOCOM, that is Special Operations Command, you have like Navy SEALs, uh, Green Berets in the Army, uh, Marines have MARSOC, Air Force has PJs and CCTs, and there are a few other guys floating around as well with, you know, still in the same branches, different missions though. And so it's this very specific uh, very narrow lane of operators uh, who do unique missions. Uh, they're not doing conventional, you know, again, one year deployments doing patrols for peacekeeping. Like a, a Green Beret ODA is a 12 man team that will go into a foreign country and advise and assist the local people, the local rebellion per se, uh, to, you know, Free the oppressed is their motto to you know, these oppressive governments, you know, Saddam Hussein and others, uh, the Taliban, Al Qaeda, bin Laden, who rule by force. They murder their own people. They do beheadings if you don't follow their ideology. And so uh, these special operations teams go in and remove, you know, dictators and these bad people from power. Uh, it's, again, as a civilian, doing probably a pretty bad job of describing what they do exactly, but it's just a very secretive, specialized mission. Well, and they're under obviously under a great amount of stress. Yes. Um, and so, um, if there was any a group of people looking for an excursion, um, this is certainly you know a, a, a group that's deserving and needs one for sure. Um, so your business started growing. You had more and more people calling you wanting to do hunts. And um, at, at what point did you start to consider maybe I should uh, give up my my day job? About two years ago. Uh, so we had outgrown, <clears throat> outgrown our family hunting lodge here in West Tennessee. I call it lodge, hunting cabin, small cabin. So we had outgrown that about two years ago. And that was kind of the big moment. We're like, okay, do we go full bore, raise more capital, do larger events for fundraising and move beyond our little hunting cabin by our own lodge for the troops. And so that was uh, the big move. So uh, 2018, we bought a lodge here in West Tennessee, a full-time lodge. Uh, it's a 14 bed facility that we run these guys, uh, their teammates on these hunting trips. We also do family events throughout the rest of the year. So you have a guy and his wife and kids come out for a weekend getaway. They might go fishing or canoeing, skeet shooting, just kind of their own agenda. We provide the options of A, B, C, and D. They might pick A and B. It's just a weekend getaway for free. Biggest thing. They come out to a lodge full of food, volunteer guides. Their only expense is a little bit of fuel to get here from their own base. Uh, you know, with that, buying the lodge, and pushing for more fundraising to fund the lodge, uh, things just clicked. You know how it goes. Just it clicked all at once across the board, across the nation. And we had larger sponsors. We had corporations sponsoring us all of a sudden. And uh, my wife, again, which is a, a very kind lady, said, you can't do both. Like, you're working your butt off seven days a week. You know, pick one or the other. Like, what do you want to do? And I was like, well... You know, you feel the calling sometimes, and I, I felt the spiritual calling to invest my life to the military, giving back and providing whatever I could to the military and their families. And so uh, I kind of closed down my business at that point, and I went full bore, full time into the nonprofit. Uh, and again, as you do that and invest more time, we again, we grew and grew and grew and grew. So about last summer, I would say, uh, yeah, but I guess last spring, last summer, made the decision to sell our home in Nashville. Uh, again, close down my business, my, my day job, move back to West Tennessee and go full time into the nonprofit just to see what happens. You know, it, it might be a success, might be a failure, but unless you do it, you just don't know. So uh, leap of faith, move back to West Tennessee and here we are uh, running full time the foundation and then COVID hit. 
And uh, again, we can't really bring in guys from across the country to rural West Tennessee uh, with the risk of, you know, infecting locals or infecting guys on base and taking an entire base out with COVID. So uh, we closed operations down back in March and that was, we get it. We're not, you know, sad, but we're sad. We're sad to close down and not give back and not have these guys and their families out this entire year. Felt very empty inside by not having the events. But again, now fall is here. Uh, I know COVID is spiking across the country in places, but a lot of our bases, uh, it's not as bad there. And we are doing socially distanced, you know, deer hunts where you have guys out in the, by themselves. They're not really doing these large events. We're not really mixing guys from the country. Uh, we're doing temperature checks and all those good things. And we're, again, back in business at a probably one third of capacity level. We're not going again wide open, but we are doing at least some events every day across the country. So um, how are, how, how is the future of your nonprofit different now after COVID than it would have been before COVID? I know for Discovery Park, you know, the, the period in which we've all been living will certainly impact the things we do in the future. Are there things that you think might, you might do different because of, of having this little period of time to, almost think and reorganize and breathe? Uh, yes. Yes and no. I mean, our, our mission's the same. You know, we're not going to deviate from that or change that. Uh, how we do our events might change a little bit. Um, again, once COVID vaccine and things are out there and we're back to a no infection rate, you know, our goal would be to get back to having out, you know, larger like four to eight men for a duck hunt or four to eight guys for this or that, you know, right now we're limiting it to four men per event. So that's just a, that's a small group of guys. We have capacity to hold, you know, 14 to 16 guys really per event. Uh, so I'm not sure how it's going to look to be really honest. I mean, if COVID goes away, we're back to again, wide open. If it stays around forever and doesn't go away, it mutates and keeps morphing and changing we might be a four man event program from here on out. You know, we just, we just don't know. Um, I know that you um, also uh, market to, if that's the right word, you make available your services to people who are not necessarily hunters, people who just want to get away. Um, talk a little bit about that, about what other things uh, folks can do who are serving uh, sure. that you work with. Yeah. So, you know, like all things, you're always growing and changing. And for us, you know, a few years ago, you're meeting all these guys on basis for meetings, you know, might be a 12 man team and yeah, four of the guys hunt, but the rest do not. Uh, they might be into NASCAR races or horseback riding or over landing in vehicles or hiking Appalachian trail. So we kind of did a reorganization of our program at that time and branched out into new things. So now we have, uh, we send troops to NASCAR races, which is a lot of fun. Uh, guys are just motorhead and gearheads. Uh, we've also linked up with Nashville musicians uh, for guys who are into playing guitar. And we'll bring guys to West Tennessee from Nashville, from bass, for a weekend of jam session. We just fire pit, we grill out, and just play music all weekend. It's been a pretty fun one. Uh, we're doing you know canoe trips and kayaking trips. I mean, it's just kind of all things in the outdoors is the new genre for our program. Again, day one was hunting and fishing. Now it's this big, broad umbrella stroke or paintbrush stroke of, you know, what are you into in the outdoors? Let us facilitate that for you, cover your costs and get you into the outdoors. So there may be, may be people listening who have um, a great idea or who have a little nonprofit they're working with. Um, you've obviously taken yours to the next level. Um, what are some of the uh, tactics and tools that, you know, and let's pretend like the world is COVID free. Mm -hmm. um, so, so without COVID involved, what are some of the things that you've done that you feel like have led to your success? Uh, a couple of things. Number one, mentorship. Uh, for me, day one, uh, a guy on Facebook reached out and found me, Dave Winters. Uh, he lives in Tampa, Florida, runs his own military charity called Black Dagger Military Hunting Club. And he serves wounded warriors and veterans. Kind of, again, anyone who served is welcome to his place. 
but you know, Dave was kind of giving me just some direction of, Hey, do this. Don't do this. Uh, you'd see a Facebook post. Hey man, next time don't word that like this. That was huge. I just, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just going into it blind and Dave stepped up and he's still a mentor now years later. Uh, but he was a huge, huge part of getting us to where we are now. Uh, locally speaking, another mentor was Shane Hall. Uh, Shane lived in Dyersburg. He has since passed away, but Shane ran a program called Whelan Sportsman uh, for outdoorsmen who were confined to wheelchairs with injuries and getting people back into the outdoors. Anybody, military, civilian, didn't matter. Shane was the same boat. He was very supportive, gave me lots of do's and don'ts. And without Shane and Dave, there's no way we could have doubled in size those first few years. There was so much great direction of, hey, you're doing a great job. You know, just tweak this and tweak that. That's my opinion. It was never you have to do this, but just our thoughts are X, Y, Z. Please do this and might have better success. So that went really well. Uh, running a 501c3 that depends on the public to give you money is very stressful. I'm sure you guys know as well. You're always fundraising, always. Uh, without the money, there's no program. Uh, a big lesson for me in the early days was being told no and not being offended by it. You know, you solicit donations and grants all the time and you hear no all of the time. You know, not every grant wants to give money to a hunting charity that involves guns in the outdoors. Not a good mesh sometimes. Uh, so again, being told no probably... <laughs> three to four times when you talk to somebody, it's just a flat out, you know what? It's not a good fit. Not this time. Try again next year. Uh, 25% says maybe, and then maybe 10% say yes. End of the day that will give you a grant that will give you a free NASCAR race tickets that will give you a free Airbnb at the beach for a family to use. And so you're just constantly, constantly marketing yourself and the program out to the general public, you know, asking for support and, I guess my biggest piece of advice would be don't get discouraged for someone new in a 501c3. You know, keep pushing forward, have your one year, your five year or 10 year goals and don't lose sight of that. Just keep asking the tough questions, keep putting yourself out there, keep doing podcasts, you know, get your mission to the public. And, you know, with that, at least with us, the good things came to us in time. Like, like with discovery park, I noticed that, um, you know, a lot of what you guys do with your fundraising and with your communications is you're basically saying, hey, look, here's this opportunity. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're passionate about. If you're interested in that, please join us, you know. And so, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times people will say, oh, I don't know how you ask for money. But really what you're doing is saying, hey, look, here's an opportunity, you know, for being able to do some good in the world. If you're interested, please partner with us. So I, I know I see that shining through in a lot of the communications that that you all do. Um, speaking of communications, so talk a little bit about um, you obviously have to blur out the faces or choose to blur out the faces on a lot of the folks that are um, that you're using on Instagram. Instagram is obviously a uh, uh, a social media that's all photo based. So you know, you post your photos, but you have to blur out the people's faces, you know, for privacy uh, reasons, and you have to limit what you say. And, um, you know, talk a little bit about uh, digital communication and communication in general. How do you let people know about the work that you're doing? Yeah, so kind of, you know, one of our founders' main ideas, Brian's from uh, Fort Lewis, was if we're going to do this thing and do it right, uh, we are not going to use our guests to make money off them. Uh, if we're going to do a program, it's not going to be a catch. We're not going to show their faces. We're not going to say their names. We're not going to say what they belong to unit wise. There's some big units out there that are very famous. We're not going to name drop all those. You know, it's not, we'll sacrifice growth and sacrifice Instagram. Cool. Thousand like photographs for 25 likes to not use the guys. So uh, that was a, a pretty big decision early on. Like, we're not going to do those things. Uh, I think it's probably challenged us and kept us a little bit of a slower growth break by not having these impactful pictures of guys, you know, doing whatever. Like we're just, we're, we don't do that. 
Uh, so we do blur out their faces. That's for their security. Uh, a lot of these guys have bounties out on their heads in other countries. That's just, that's a real thing for them. That's not for us here in Nashville, but it is in Iraq, other places. So, uh, it's been tough with social media, not tough, that's the wrong word. It's not tough at all. It's just been challenging to adequately thank donors and sponsors for giving us product, capital, chances for their lodges to be used, but at the same time, not use your guys coming out with you, you know, being respectful and mindful of their privacy. Um, think social media is a good thing for 501c3s. It does get your word out. Um, social media is a double-edged sword. Um, I'm a fan, but not a fan of it. I think uh, a lot of people get just too deep into it. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's people like an alter ego. There's their social media presence and there's their real presence. And trying to keep our program on the same level. Like there's who we are from social media. I don't want it to ever be like, Oh, socks is this big giant social media, whatever with hunting pictures. Well, no, it's not about that at all. It's about the men and their families and you're trying to keep that again, you know, shown clearly it's about the men, their families, their children, and not about war or guns or this or that or anything crazy or political, you know, being non-political as well. It's trying to be neutral and, being an advocate for the military and giving back. So what about uh, one big issue in the, in the nonprofit world uh, relates to like fundraisers, because obviously uh, sometimes you end up on some kind of fundraiser spending more money <laughs> implementing the fundraiser than you actually raise. So there, uh, which is sometimes counterintuitive. Um, do you uh, have any of those kind of things or what, what have you learned from, from that world? Uh, again, we've been blessed. We're a very blessed program. Uh, we had a fundraiser in Clarksville on Saturday night uh, for Rose's Bourbon. My buddy Lauren Simpson held a private tasting for us. You know, and same thing, uh, like Lauren and Four Roses, they cover all the cost of the event, which is huge, as you know. That's bottom line percentage of money to public. You receive money back out to programs. So they're kind of covering these front end costs. They have the event and they give us a backside check. So, you know, our overhead for that event was zero. We had no program money invested to raise money. So if, if we make $10,000 when the events all send there or $20,000, whatever it might be, that's money right back in program without being overhead. And so, you know, we're an all volunteer uh, venture as well. So there's no paid staff here. Um, and we're very proud of the fact that we run overhead under 10%. It was 5% or under for a lot of years. And as you've grown, you have more lawyer costs, more CPA costs, but, you know, still 9% of our money in goes back to our families and troops. And we're very proud of that. You know, we do a, go ahead. Another, another part of um, running a 501c3 nonprofit is having a board. Um, for Discovery Park, we have a really talented board of uh, regional um, executives in all different types of businesses. Um, I'm assuming you guys have a board. Um, we do. What kind of uh, individuals uh, serve on the board of your organization? We have a five-person board. Uh, so we're, we're a little smaller than most, but these are the five people on the board. Are the same thing. Are very talented. They're very intelligent, and from day one believe the mission. You know, I toss this random idea out there, like our program lawyer, uh, Thomas Moncrief lives in Nashville. Great guy. Uh, I mentioned to Thomas, like, Hey, I have an idea for a 501c3 nonprofit doing this stuff for the military, including the outdoors. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts? And, you know, he's one of the first guys who jump for joy. Like, let's do this. I'm on board. What can I do? What do you need? Let's, let's, let's crush this thing. And, uh, Meeting a lawyer with all things starting out, you know, I asked Thomas, would you be our program lawyer and for the director advisor for us? And he was all about it. And our entire board is that way. They're all enthusiastic. Six years later, they're still enthusiastic. They're still going out, creating their own leads, creating their own programs without having myself as the, you know, 
I guess the founder board chairman having a thumb or finger on the pulse the entire time. Like guys go out, do your own thing, excel at it. We're here to coach you along as things develop. But, I mean, I'm sure you guys know that's a blessing having a board who's interactive, who's, out there being a great spokesperson for DPA. Like you have yeah, to absolutely. The, the words that jumped out at me that you said was jump for joy. You know, you want, if you're running a nonprofit, you want a board, you want board members that are jumping for joy, you know, over your successes and over your organization. And we're blessed with that as well. So um, as you, as you plan for the future and as you daydream, um, as you set vision, you know, for how high you can go and how high you want to go. Let's assume there is no COVID. Um, what does the future look like for you and the organization? Yeah, so uh, kind of from our short term, you know, five-year goals, uh, we really want to buy some property, you know, here in West Tennessee somewhere, uh, you know, build a lodge on site, have a fishing pond or a fishing lake, have a trap range for shooting skeet, have hiking trails, and have a true retreat center for the military right here in West Tennessee somewhere. Uh, you know, if funding continues to grow, that's a legit possibility. And we're hoping in five years we can start that process of seeking out land to purchase, uh, you know, making that next big jump. Uh, my crazy 10-year goal would be kind of the same thing. Let's recreate what we built here in West Tennessee somewhere else. Let's go to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Let's go out west somewhere and let's recreate our same atmosphere, our same lodge, our same retreat center across the country somewhere else and let more vets, let more military guys and their families experience what we provide here in West Tennessee. You know, we have a great community here of patriots, uh, just people who care. And that's countrywide, it's nationwide. TV may not appear that way, but we're still a great country of people who care. And uh, we feel like we can find that community somewhere else that has the same love of country and military to recreate this and do it better than us, you know, excel and do it much better. We've got to find that community. We've got to find the land and find the builder, find the capital for the lodge and all those little small pieces really add up, but it's, it's doable. So for people who might be listening, who want to either uh, be part um, of your vision or uh, might uh, have more information that they want to get, uh, how, how do people uh, track you down? Sure. Uh, so our website is just specialopsexcursions.org. Uh, excursions is spelt a little funny. We dropped the E, so it's X-C-U-R-S-I-O-N-S. Uh, there's also so- social media. We are on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram, you can find us on there. Um, any direct messaging on there goes to our team. Uh, we'll reply back within 24 hours typically. You know, we can schedule a phone call or an email and keep dialogue going for ways to give back. Again, financially, uh, opportunities, you know, in the outdoors. Again, maybe a mountain chalet in Gatlinburg or a beach house in Florida. You can donate for a week to a family or you're a hunting outfitter somewhere. Might want to give a, a weekend pass for free to a guy or their family. Uh, so we, all of those things are all kind of ran through our website, social media, and our five-person board. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing with Special Ops Excursions, and thank you uh, for being um, on Real Foot Forward. Honored to be here. And Scott, thanks for your time today, buddy. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.